the smothering Indian summer of 1857, whispers of discontent danced through the streets in the form of small wheat cakes called chupatas, foretelling a storm that would shake the very foundation of the British Raj. But despite concerns from officials, British superiors dismissed its importance, considering it a trivial issue. Little did they know that was only the beginning, and the spark that would ignite the tinderbox of resentment lurked near, ushering in the drums of rebellion and birthing atrocities upon atrocities in a cycle of unrelenting brutality. Brace yourself for a journey back in time filled with wars, chaos, brutality, and blood. This story is a tale of the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Before the Rebellion. In the early 17th century, the British company called the British East India Company arrived in India with the initial goal of trading spices, which were highly sought after in Europe for preserving meat. Beyond spices, their trade activity expanded to include silk, cotton, indigo dye, tea, and opium in the Indian Ocean regions. However, like most powerful colonial companies, they controlled a large base of military organization in India, consisting of British office native infantry and cavalry, British troops, regular army troops, and irregular cavalry. At its peak, the company administered three armies with over 250,000 men, known as sepoys, consisting of high caste Hindus and comparatively wealthy Muslims in its largest army, the Bengal Presidency, the poorer Muslims in the irregular cavalry units, and the low caste Hindus in the regular infantry and cavalry regiments. But as time passed, several factors shook the foundation of these Sepoy's loyalty, eventually leading to a full-blown rebellion in 1857, born out of a combination of factors such as perceived disrespect, breakdown of rapport with British officers, and the intrusion of European missionaries. Additionally, it was said to be majorly triggered by concerns among Indian soldiers in the British East India Company's army regarding rumors of greased cartridges for the new Enfield rifles. These rifles were said to use mini balls, which required biting the paper cartridges to release the powder. However, rumors circulated that the grease on the cartridges included beef tallow, which was offensive to Hindus, and pork lard, which was offensive to Muslims. Despite having acknowledged the issue's sensitivity, the British company officials proceeded with the grease cartridge production, paving the way for the disruption of the rebellion in 1857. The Brave and Religious Panday Starting the unrest on March 29, 1857, at the Barakpur Parade Ground near Kolkata, was Mangal Penday, an angry 29-year-old soldier from the 34th Bengal Native Infantry who had grown angry and discontent about the East India Company's recent actions. Thus, he rebelled against his commanders, hoping to incite other sepoys. Upon learning about Panday's rebellion, Sergeant Major James Hewson went to investigate. But upon seeing Panday, he was shot at by him. Immediately, Houston raised an alarm, prompting another lieutenant, Henry Bao, to come to the scene to assess the situation. Still, he was also shot by Panday, hitting his horse. Upon hearing the chow, General John Hearsey intervened, describing Panday as being in a religious frenzy and ordering Jemadar Ishwari Prasad, the Indian commander of the quarter guard, to arrest Panday. However, Jemadar refused. Eventually, a soldier, Shaikh Poltu, prevented Panday from further violence. Now unable to incite his comrades into a full rebellion, Mangal Panday attempted to take his own life by shooting himself with his musket. However, he only succeeded in injuring himself and was subsequently court-martialed and hanged on April 8th. War, War, War Following this event, in April, there were disturbances in Agra, Allahabad, and Ambala, a significant military cantonment. General Anson, the commander-in-chief of the Bengal army, foresaw the potential rebellion over the use of cartridges. Despite objections from civilian authorities, he decided to delay the musketry practice at Ambala and introduce a new drill where soldiers tore the cartridges with their fingers. However, 
He should have issued general orders for this practice throughout the Bengal army, but he failed. So, while there was no open revolt in Ambala, late April witnessed widespread arson, especially targeting barracks and British officers' residences. Ultimately, on April 24th, Lieutenant Colonel George Carmichael Smith ordered his men to perform firing drills, leading to a significant refusal to accept the cartridges. Thus, the Sepoys were imprisoned, causing unrest within the garrison. The situation, however, escalated on May 9th when the imprisoned soldiers were stripped of their uniforms and placed in shackles, leading to a revolt that resulted in the killing of British officers, civilians, and Indian civilians who attempted to defend or conceal their employers. Meanwhile, in Delhi, on the morning of May 11th, the first units of the 3rd Cavalry arrived, positioning themselves below the windows of the king's quarters in the palace, where they called upon Bahadur Shah to acknowledge and lead them. However, the king, initially treating them as ordinary petitioners, took no immediate action, causing more unrest to spread quickly within the palace, marking the beginning of the Indian Rebellion of 1857. The Slaughterhouse During the Indian Rebellion of 1857, there were no all-British regiments in Delhi as Sepoys in the Delhi garrison killed their officers. Although some officers managed to escape with the help of loyal Sepoys, many were killed. Now, amid the chaos in Kanpur, the garrison commander fortified hospital barracks for the British community. While in London, Prime Minister Palmerston initially underestimated the rebellion's severity, but was criticized by Queen Victoria over the demobilization of British troops after the Crimean War, eventually causing them to send a relief force of 40,000 soldiers to India. Meanwhile, General Wheeler, concerned about imminent uprisings, sought Nana Sahib's help to reinforce the Sepoy Guard at the Treasury. Unknown to him, Nana Sahib, the Maharaja of Ithur, held a grudge against the East India Company. Yet, he complied, sending 500 men, elephants, and guns for protection. As tensions escalated on June 3rd, Wheeler ordered the evacuation of non-soldiers to a fortified compound. Unfortunately, they would discover slain Europeans in the river shortly after, begetting the uprising on June 5th, which was led by Sepoys who looted the treasury with Nana Sahib's acquiescence. A merciless death by thirst. During the chaos, the once secure shelter for civilians and soldiers turned into a place of unbearable suffering due to scarce provisions and limited water sources. To fetch water, men risked their lives, facing opposition from fellow soldiers. According to the descriptions of Lieutenant Mowbray Thompson, the situation at the shelter was so terrible that women and children cried for water. Yet, sniper fire and the heated sun added to their agony. Meanwhile, outside the shelter, rebels brutally attacked those caught unprotected, sparing no mercy for children. According to eyewitnesses, a district magistrate, Charles Hillersden, was torn apart by a cannonball while standing with his nursing wife, Lydia, who unfortunately suffered the same fate, with the cannonball crushing her skull into a debris of bricks two days later leaving her baby to an uncertain fate. Hence, most people were scared to go outside. And so, after enduring two weeks of siege, the shelter housed a desperate mix of half-starved children, the sick, and individuals in various states of distress, including children raving mad from thirst and hunger. Luckily for them, a letter arrived from Nana Sahib, offering them a safe passage down the Genghis River. With limited options, General Wheeler accepted with the condition of retaining weapons. And so the evacuation began two days later, with carts carrying the sick and wounded down to the Ganges, followed by the walking wounded as General Wheeler and his men trailed behind, excited to escape. On reaching the river at the village of Sati Chaura, they saw bamboo boats prepared for boarding. Hence, the fittest men entered into the river, carrying women, children, and the sick as silent native boatmen observed, surrounded by mutineers on both riverbanks. But after most of the British had boarded, the boatmen unexpectedly abandoned the ship, forcing the British to fire at them. Simultaneously, mutineers on the riverbanks unleashed a barrage of musket and cannon fire at the British, 
ushering a chaotic massacre as many Sepoys came out of hiding, firing at the boats. As a result of the shooting, the river quickly became filled with bodies with babies floating downstream. In an attempt to save themselves and their children, some desperate women tried to hide in the bloody water, and men attempted to push boats midstream. But they were faced with a brutal massacre in the water by cavalrymen. Within an hour, almost every British man lay lifeless, with only one boat lucky to escape, carrying two English officers and two Irish privates. Meanwhile, the survivors at the shelter, which were approximately 120 women and children, were spared immediate death, but later imprisoned by Nana Sahib's stronghold, including General Wheeler, who would face a gruesome end at the hands of merciless Sepoys. The Blood of the Innocent As this dark chapter continued in Kanpur, a British relief column led by General Sir Henry Havelock headed towards Allahabad, unaware of the horror that had already transpired. And by the time Havelock intervened, nearly 6,000 Indians had fallen victim to the brutal retaliation of the British. And so he headed for Kanpur. On reaching Kanpur, Havelock witnessed unimaginable horror following the merciless execution of British women and children by the rebel-led Sovereign Khan, an embittered half-caste with a deep-seated hatred for the innocent who ruthlessly slaughtered 73 women and 103 children within the compound. Now following the military suppression of the war by the British East India Company, internal divisions among the rebels, and the arrival of British forces in 1858, Nana Sahib feared impending doom fleeing westward, leaving behind the city stained with the blood of the innocent, adorned on the wall and splattered on the floor. Outside the city, a well once used by besieged British forces had also become a sinister grave filled with the lifeless bodies of women and children. Having been able to regain control of their rule, the British, in the wake of the bloodbath, forced prisoners to lick the blood-soaked compound floor. Meanwhile, high-caste Brahmins faced execution by low-caste street sweepers, and some were tied to cannons and blown to pieces. Despite all these, an organized frenzy to avenge the murder of innocent civilians in Kanpur and other places began in Lucknow by the British. Hence, the killing, looting, and burning continued throughout the summer of 1859. Naming this thirst for revenge, the Indians called it the Devil's Wind. The End of a Brutal Chapter Eventually ending this brutal chapter in India's history, on July 8, 1859, the British Crown granted amnesty to all rebels who did not commit murder, formally declaring the war to a formal end, therefore ushering in a new era of direct British rule over India. So, what are your thoughts on this? Let us know in the comment section below and remember to hit that subscribe button. To watch more insane and unique stories, click on the video options on the screen. You won't regret it.